At 7.15 on the morning of February the 21st, the German attack begins. After the bombardment, German troops equipped with a newly invented flamethrower infiltrate the area. begins to look like a promising victory. They gain valuable ground and take an increasing number of prisoners. The French troops are outnumbered at this point by up to 10 to 1 in some sectors. The reinforcements that are hurriedly sent to the front are decimated quickly in the face of the heavy German artillery. The first real aerial battles in history are won by the Germans as they shoot down all the observation balloons and French aircraft. The top German air aces served at the Verdun front, names that would go down in history. The young Hermann Goering, for one. Kaiser and Crown Prince are pleased with the initial success and begin handing out the first decorations of the campaign. But the order is to continue the attack. By the 25th of February, the Germans have reached the fort of Duermont, one of several surrounding Verdun. Because on both sides, however, as the weeks drag on. On the sacred way, the traffic continues to roll. By the end of the battle, every division in the French army will have traveled it twice on the average. As the troops get closer to the front, the countryside seems to have disappeared. There is no vegetation, only trenches and shell holes. The major battle has broken up into a series of deadly encounters between small groups of men, often fighting hand to hand. The Germans continue to launch assaults against French positions. before their stretch.
soldier on leave is warmly received by the civilians, and yet he might feel ill at ease in the midst of so many normal everyday sights. It is a strange world to the soldiers on leave. They return to the front with mixed feelings, happy for the short rest, but perhaps relieved to return to their comrades. It is hard to communicate the feelings of the front to civilians who haven't directly experienced the horrors of war. is the universal enemy. Thousands of soldiers on both sides disappeared in the shell holes of the battlefield where they could not be found or helped. are the conditions under which men have lived for eight months. By September of 1916, the French High Command is ready to mount an offensive. In their original assault.
At the beginning of October, everything is ready. General Mongin inspects his regiment with President Poincaré. The cannons are positioned over a five kilometer front and eight special divisions are ready to follow up the barrage which will last three days. the 24th, the French army leaves its trenches and advances in strength for the first time. America, whose atomic bomb had knocked Japan out of the war the year before, was flexing its muscles. of the world watched in horror, but in the Cold War, any advantage had to be exploited. We're closed. General Clay, the American governor of Berlin, asked President Truman to supply the city by air. It was a tremendous gamble. Berlin had two and a half million inhabitants, but because of the Cold War battle in which they were embroiled, the Americans had to try to save Berlin. Western allies quickly built two new airfields on the outskirts of the city. The U.S. Air Force gathered its transport planes from all over the world, from Hawaii, Alaska, the United States, and even Japan. Within a month, the American DC-4s were making over a thousand flights a day into Berlin, a landing every minute, day and night, in every kind of way. Very nice. Now you're starting to go a little bit above your glide path, and 15, 20 feet above your glide path, you'll have to increase your rate of descent. Approaching the graveyard now, you're over the graveyard. Over a period of 11 months, American aircraft carried two and a half million tons into the beleaguered city. Food and products of every kind. Employed to intimidate the enemy. The Western Allies and the Russians were continually deploying their forces to prove that they were ready for war. tranquility of the Nevada desert, the light from the atomic blasts lit up the sky over Las Vegas. The world was on the verge of war, and it would be a struggle with the potential to destroy the planet. of words continued.
atomic submarines would soon join them and patrol the ocean. of this awesome military strength, the UN forces and the Americans were in trouble in Korea. They held on grimly with their backs to the sea in a pocket around the port of Busan. on for two months until reinforcements began to arrive. This was a United Nations operation, but it was clear that it was American prestige that was at stake. The United States had to assure the people of the free world that they were not only willing, but also capable of stopping the spread of communism. Commander-in-Chief, General MacArthur, had a reputation as a bold strategist, and he gave much thought to a devastating counter-offensive that would relieve the American position. He decided to take the North Koreans by surprise in an operation designed to cut their supply lines. On the 11th of September, 1951, the landing forces arrived at Incheon, a beach resort of Seoul. 230 ships, all veterans of the Pacific War. destruction were well founded. November 1952. This is the atoll of any Wetok. New tests were being conducted here. The first hydrogen bomb. 200 times the strength of Hiroshima. Canada continued searching the sky. On May 1st, 1960, over Russia, a blip on the radar screen was picked up, and the surface-to-air missiles were launched. with an American U-2 spy plane and by in a state of alert. American power swung into action. Thousands of soldiers, the Strategic Air Command and its B-52s, the atomic submarines of the U.S. Navy. Over a thousand strike aircraft were ready. The U.S. atomic missiles were also put on standby. T-34 
Tuesday, October 16th. In the late afternoon, Robert McNamara held a conference at the Pentagon with the Chiefs of Staff. He appointed Admiral Anderson to take charge of Operation X. American aircraft reported that 25 Soviet ships were steaming on a course for Cuba. War seemed inevitable. It was too late for either side to back down and save face. At 7.50 on the 25th of October, 1962, an American destroyer intercepted a Russian freighter. It signaled the Soviet ship to turn about. For two and a half hours, the two vessels sailed on. For two and a half hours, the world was on the verge of war. Khrushchev announced that he was withdrawing his missile. In exchange, Kennedy promised not to invade. Khrushchev had lost faith. He would never fully recover from the showdown over Cuba. Kennedy had proved himself the most determined, the United States the strongest. Both of the missile silos, at 8.30, an American would have pressed the button to launch the rocket. a Russian would have pressed a similar button. Minutes later, 300 million people would have been killed. Many more would have died a slow, painful death from radioactive fallout. Mankind now understood what the balance of terror meant. Brinksmanship. Peace through fear and intimidation. The forces of destruction on both sides were so great that neither superpower could allow war to break out. They could, however, continually test each other's nerve and resolve. The Soviets had an immense army. Three and a half million men, 35,000 tanks, 1,500 intercontinental missiles, they were also rumored to have the capability of putting a satellite bomb in orbit around the Earth. They had thermonuclear warheads of 100 megatons, 100 million tons of TNT, 5,000 times the bomb that wiped out Hiroshima. In February 1961, aboard camouflaged sampans, hidden in the South Vietnamese jungle, the National Liberation Front was born. By the end of 1961, the jungle rebels, known as the Viet Cong, had turned vast areas in the South into zones where the government forces could not maintain control. South Vietnam, the army was beaten in skirmish after skirmish. The Americans grew worried. President Kennedy sent 600 instructors in June 1961 to train the soldiers of the Saigon regime. The U.S. was also troubled by the corruption of the DM government. With $40 million, the conditions were unlike anything these soldiers had ever encountered before. Their enemy wore no uniform and were masters of guerrilla warfare. 
Without clear objectives, it was hard for the Americans to know if they were winning or losing. of the escalating involvement of the Americans, the Viet Cong would not be defeated. On January 31, 1968, they staged the Tet Offensive and for a while held many South Vietnamese cities. The Americans quickly regained control, but the enemy seemed to be getting stronger, not weaker. The war was not confined to the bush, but now reached everywhere. Cholon, the Chinese court of Saigon, was totally destroyed by napalm. 